Hi, Brandon. I'm waiting for uh, two o'clock so that we start exactly on time. <clears throat> okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to uh, Chapter 5. We're still doing Chapter 5. And uh, I just want to pick up uh, from where we left off last time around. We were talking about, about basically the spectrum of all of the electromagnetic uh, lights. Can I at least have one or two people to confirm that this is where we stopped last time around? I think it was, just to make sure. Yeah, yeah it's this place okay. where we stopped. Okay, very good. So I want to go back to another point in here that uh, uh, we did last time around, and it may not have been 100% here. I'm going to stop sharing this. PowerPoint and I'm going to go to another one to uh, the other slide basically where we're doing the calculation so uh, to make sure that you guys know how to do this calculation remember last time we said that uh, if we have a red light at the given frequency which was 4.5 times 10 to the power 14 hertz uh, we calculated basically and we found that the uh, let me see if I can move this out of my way uh, that the uh, wavelength was uh, 667 nanometers. So I want to make sure to show you step by step on how to do this so that uh, we don't do it uh, too quickly and we miss some points where you're doing your own question. Okay, let me bring this tool in here because I'm going to do it by hand. So basically, the frequency was given to be 4.5 times 10 to the power 14 hertz, correct? Okay, and also I know the dispersion law says that the speed of light or the speed of electromagnetic radiation in general is related to the wavelength lambda times the frequency, okay? Since I know that C is equal to 300 million or three times 10 to the power eight, meter per second, I should be able to derive from here to find what the wavelength is be. And that is more of a number that you will see when you're talking about the, uh, about the uh, uh, light, about light in general. So what we do in this case, we say, okay, C from this expression in here is equal to lambda F. That means lambda is equal to C over F. Since I have C to be three times 10 to the power eight, and I have F to be 4.5 times 10 to the power negative 14. I mean, positive 14, I'm sorry, not correct. So the first thing first we do when we're doing calculations like this one is handle the power. I have 10 to the positive eight in here, and I have 10 to the positive 14. So whatever the answer is gonna be, is gonna be 10 to the power, it, the numerator is uh, positive, and whatever is in the denominator, I have to subtract it from there. So it's going to be 10 to the negative 14. Then I have to handle with a calculator 3 over 4.5. I have uh, actually on my computer the calculator. If you have a calculator, that should be uh, fine too. If not, any any uh, software that does a calculation for you to give you what 3 over 4.5 is. Should be if I have my calculator in here. What is it? Uh, three divided by four point five. Where 
0.667 basically. Usually we stop at uh, at uh, three six six. Okay, so instead of doing 0.0667, first of all, eight minus 14. That number is 10 to the negative. 14 minus eight is six. six. Yes. Okay. So six with a negative sign. So in here I have 0 0.66 and I'm gonna round to 667. Now, when we're doing wavelength, usually we express it in terms of a nanometer. And a nanometer, you don't have to, at this point, if you say that this is how much it is, you're good. You guys understand that? If you're doing gap creation and you say, okay, it's 0 0.667 times 10 to the negative six, that is correct, actually. It's not in scientific notation, if you guys remember. I need to do it in scientific notation, so I'm gonna write it 6.67 times 10 to the negative seven, because I moved the decimal point back this way, so I'm gonna uh, decrease this number. So you say 6.67 times 10 to the negative uh, seven. So if you did it this way, the, the wavelength is in meters, okay? If you did it this way and you reach this point, that's just fine, 100%. You don't have to do the next step. And that is to divide it by 10 to the negative nine because a nanometer is 10 to the, nano is 10 to the negative nine. If you do that, that's extra, you don't have to. 10 to the negative seven divided by 10 to the negative uh, nine. And again, I'm going to have again, minus seven in the numerator, minus minus eight, nine, so it's gonna be minus minus nine, so it's gonna be a positive nine. So I have a minus nine, plus, uh, plus minus seven plus nine, that's two, positive two. And 10 to the power two, that results from this equation, 10 to the power two is 100. So all I have to do is multiply 6.67 by 100, and the answer should be 667, 667 nanometers. The last step, as I said, is not needed, is not necessary, I should say. If you reach this point in your calculation, that's fine, namely 0 0.067, that's fine. Uh, in scientific notation, it's gonna be this way. And in the, uh, basically the short version is gonna be this way when we move to the uh, nanometers, if you want to do that. Are we clear on that? So I expect now for your case, when you're doing the actual calculation, you're not doing the satellite, you want to do the, uh, the uh, violet light, which is uh, the frequency is about seven times 10 to the power positive 14. So everything should be the same, except this number to change to seven. And yeah, then you're gonna find a different number in here. And from there, you're going to tell me what's the wavelength for, uh, for uh, the violet. So that was the clarification from the last time around. Now, to, let me stop the sharing and continue with the discussion on the uh, chapter. If you guys have a question, you can always intervene or you can actually type it in the chat room in there so that we can uh, have, a, have a discussion about that, okay? Does this sound like a good plan? Good. I see that nobody objected. <laughs> okay. So this is basically the wavelength for different uh, uh, objects that we can see. And this is basically some of the properties of the electromagnetic radiation in general. Light, visible light, our eyes are sensitive to this region where it says visible. That is a narrow region, basically from 400 to 700 nanometers. That's the unit in here. We cannot see ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is energetic and it can cause cancer actually, if you expose too long for, to it. X-ray and gamma rays are, are actually far more deadly. Than, than ultraviolet. Infrared is basically what we feel as heat on our skin. And this is used actually in technology to cook because water wave uh, wavelengths, actually the microwave region is the one that is used for, I'm sorry, the infrared is used for telecommunications actually for your uh, remote control, for example. And then you have the microwave region is the one because the wavelength is about a few millimeters to about a meter. It's used actually for cooking because that's the, um, if you agitate the water with the frequency, let's say for example, of one centimeter or something, it's going to start to move. Um, uh, agitate move enough so that it produces heat and heat actually is motion. 
So uh, basically, at the end of the day, that's what uh, helps the food to be cooked in a microwave oven. Radio waves are used in telecommunications to carry signal over long distances. So those are the things that we know about the spectrum, and they can go all the way to kilometers, actually, not just the meters. Okay? The shorter the wavelength, like this, gamma rays, the more energetic it's going to be. And the less it's going to travel, actually. That's why it's not good for telecommunications. The longer the wavelength, the less energy it carries with it, but it's going to travel far long distances. That's why it's used in telecommunications, in sending signals and receiving signals and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is a brief talk about the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the spectrum. Now, this is a picture, actually, of the Milky Way taken by an X-ray uh, uh, telescope. Okay, this is an image of the entire galaxy, and in here, of course, X-ray you cannot see it by your with your eye because it's it's black, basically it's dark. You can't see anything. The only thing that you can see is anything between the red and the violet, basically. Uh, but the image in here is enhanced with those coloring scheme in here with different frequencies for the uh, for uh, for uh, for X because the X-ray is not a single frequency. And it's actually a band of frequencies, a range of frequencies. So uh, the lowest frequencies are going to be in here in red color. The high, the most intensive energetic uh, regions are going to be in here in the dark blue or violet region. That is basically where the, uh, the most of the galaxy is located in this, in this, uh, in this uh, if you wish. Everything else in here, there are stars and other uh, objects in here, but not as energetic in terms of emitting high energy uh, energy uh, radiation than the center of the galaxy or the middle of the, uh, the galaxy, the disk of the galaxy. So that's basically what you can see. I mean, this is, if we go outside and look at the galaxy, uh, the, uh, the Milky Way, you will see that it's a bunch of uh, basically uh, white and uh, dark colors for our eyes because that's what we're sensitive to. But with other equipment, you can actually see different radiations, how the more energetic objects emit different radiations at different higher frequencies or lower frequencies, actually. Now, uh, this is one of the properties of also the radiation. A black body radiation is similar to the sun, basically. It uh, emits all of its radiation. And uh, one of the properties of the radiation is this curve, okay? And here, the vis visible region, you see it in here, it's, it's this range again. The, the x-axis is, is the, is the uh, wavelength. And the y-axis is the intensity of some source, okay? The more energetic, the higher the temperature, and here I'm looking at 6 Kelvin temp uh, temperature of 6 Kelvin, 6,000 Kelvin, I'm sorry. The 6,000 Kelvin is slightly higher than the, uh, than the sun. The sun is about 3,500 Kelvin. So that's why an object like the sun will emit in our visible region. We, can, we are sensitive to it. It emits also higher frequencies, meaning shorter wavelength, but those are, we can see, those are the ultraviolet and anything beyond the ultraviolet in terms of uh, higher in terms of energy or uh, shorter in terms of wavelength. And then also we have the infrared region in here, which are uh, much, much longer wavelength. And here the unit on the x-axis is in nanometers. So when you see 3,000 nanometers, that's about uh, three micrometers three millionth of a meter. So it's still very short compared to our, 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 uh, our daily experience, but it's still the, uh, the radiation in here. Now, for a cooler object, 5,000 Kelvin, this is slightly cooler than the sun, it peaks just around the red. So an object that is 5,000 Kelvin will peak around the red color and will appear for the most part actually shifted toward the red. Whereas for example, for the sun, which is about 6,000 Kelvin, it appears white because all the colors combine to give you the white color, okay? For an object that is uh, even cooler than that, 4,000 Kelvin, which is something like a, probably a, uh, uh, either a star that is in red giant stage or something that is in around 4,000 Kelvin, an object like that will emit its radiation completely in the infrared region. Now, the peaks actually somewhere in the infrared region. It has some visible light, but for the most part, it's shifted toward the red. An object 3000 Kelvin will barely have anything that we can see with our, uh, our eyes. I mean, this is not even a, it's probably a brown dwarf or something like that. So it's, it's 
it's not something that emits because it doesn't emit a lot. It's not high temperature at all, 3000 Kelvin. I mean, our daily experience is still a very high temperature, but this is not high enough for us to, to see it. You see the pattern here? The higher the, the, the uh, temperature, first of all, the higher the peak, but the peak shifts toward more toward the left, meaning toward shorter wavelengths, meaning toward the blue and probably violet and even some, it can peak even in ultraviolet. Okay? Some objects are so, uh, so, so active that they can emit in, in this region. So as you take, for example, a piece of metal, which is at 300 Kelvin, the room temperature, and you start to warm it. You put it on a heater, for example. You put it on the oven. So what you will notice is it's going to start to warm. So its curve starts to rise in here. And at some point, it's warm enough that it starts to look red, OK? And then as you continue more and more and more raising its temperature, it may even get to the, to the white color, OK? If you raise its temperature high enough, first of all, you have to make sure the metal doesn't melt because Iron, for example, melts for a lot less than this. So <laughs> as long as you can increase its temperature high enough, you're going to see the entire spectrum all the way to the white. Most daily experience in here uh, is associated with the uh, with temperature that are few hundred, a few thousand uh, kelvins, and those they bring us to objects to become uh, red. Actually, way before even uh, th uh, uh, two thousand kelvins, you will start seeing red because this starts to rise a little bit. Okay. So that's our daily, ex daily experience. So the conclusion is the following as far as how the object, the bluer it is. And the cooler the object, the redder it is, actually, for our visible eyes. There is something that is on a common daily experience. We always, in our daily culture, basically, associate red with hot and blue with cool. You guys experience this concept in here, at least this daily, uh, this, uh, how should I say, it's cultural uh, experience that always when we draw hot, we draw it in red, and when we draw cool, we draw it in blue. Whereas it looks like, at least according to this curve, it's the other way around. The blue is actually hotter than red. So why is that? Why do we associate cool with, uh, with the blue and hot with red. Do you guys know anybody? Any idea? Mm -mm. It's a cultural thing. It has to do with the culture no more, okay? Because our daily experience when we warm an object hot, uh, hotter and hotter and hotter, at some point it starts to uh, look red. We never reach the blue though. Too hot to become blue because the temperatures will be in the hundreds of, actually not some sort, in the tens of thousands of Kelvin, we don't have that in our daily experience. We don't have it anywhere, at least here on the surface of the Earth, so that we can do that. So our culture basically taught us that if an object starts to appear red, it basically starts to, uh, it's to hot. When you take water, when you go to the water, the oceans, it looks blue because that's uh, cooler. So that's basically a cultural uh, thing. It has nothing to do with this curve. In other words, this is the real deal. If an object, if you're looking at the stars tomorrow, and I know I did the demo the other day, and we're going to talk about that a little more. Actually, I'm going to do another demo, right? Let me, let me look at, uh, before I do that, let me look at the, uh, uh, you guys see from here that the hotter the object, the bluer it is, the cooler the object from this temperate pattern, the, 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 the less, cool, the, the, the redder it is if it's, uh, uh, Temperature is that, uh, that if you stop the sharing of this slide in here, I'm going to come to another one actually, if I can have, if I have it uh, running, okay, to show you different stars of how they look like. Okay, where is the, here, apparently, hmm. okay, this one. Okay. So this is, uh, you guys are uh, probably saw this one in uh, some of the recordings I used before. This is called the uh, sandbox. Does everybody see this, that this looks like a galaxy? Yes? Yes. Okay, very good. So I'm gonna come in here and that's a new, uh, actually it is already new. I'm gonna add stars, okay? So it's like a simulation. This is you simulate different objects in the sky. I'm gonna add the stars 
and this is the sun, okay? The sun is basically a white star. I mean, it's, yellow, it's, it's peaked around yellow, move away from it because we're too close to it, it's too bright, okay? So this is the sun, and it looks basically uh, 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 peaked around the, the, it looks white to us because it's peaked actually around the green, to be more uh, specific. It doesn't look green because we have a lot of uh, frequencies coming together, and our eyes perceive them as white. This is a small uh, star called War 359. So I'm going to add it in here. First of all, you see the size of this star? The sun is a lot bigger than this star, okay? So this is going to orbit, actually, the sun. If I put it, oh, now it went supernova. It exploded with the sun. Let me remove that, okay? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Let me start the animation again, okay? It's, it's sometimes, let me go back into the stars. And let me show you this object in here by itself. So again, this is this is a star that emits that's a lot cooler. Actually, if I look at its properties, let me look at these. Okay, move this out of the way. So if you guys see in the bottom in here, it tells you uh, what is its temp its temperature in here. Its temperature is about 2,732 Kelvin. It's a lot cooler than the sun. The sun is about 5,500 Kelvin. So it appears not as white as the sun. Actually, it appears orangey, okay? So this is actually a brown dwarf. This is a very, very cool star, especially speaking. And uh, it's, uh, it's, when you take astronomy, when do you will learn more about this object in here and you will see them. Objects that are common in the sky, for example, one of the objects that we deal with on a on a uh, on a regular basis at least when you go to a night on the sky and i think it's going to be uh, not too bright so you can see it is uh, this star okay it's part of the uh, constellation Orion, and it's actually a very star this is uh betelgeuse okay so again if i check its properties in here and i check its temperature its temperature is a lot cooler than the sun also. It's about 2,000 Kelvin cooler than the sun, and it appear, appears orangey. But its size, if you are interested, is much, much bigger than the sun. So if I try to compare it to the sun, look at the sun in here. It's thin, okay? This is a huge object compared to the sun. And there are far more uh, other stars. I'm going to just give one more star in here just to give you a comparison with a different color star. So I'm going to start another one. Okay, and I'm going to add a star that is actually blue in color. And I know also this star, which is part of the same uh, constellation, uh, Orion. This is Rigel, actually. And Rigel's temperature is, is it's not that big compared to the sun. It's probably bigger, but it has a lot of energy in it. So if I try to add the sun to it, actually, in terms of size, it's a lot bigger. I'm sorry, I'm, still trying, I'm confusing it with Cyrus okay, or Ceres. Ceres is the one about two times masses. You can see in here, Ceres is two masses the sun of the, uh, the size of the sun. But Rigel itself is super bright star. That's its color now. It's not shifted toward the red. Actually, it's toward the blue. So if I check its properties in here, similarly, the temperature is 6,000 Kelvin. This is more than double the temperature of the sun. So, it's, it's, so that's basically what you do. That's the purpose of this whole... Uh, let me stop this one and go back to the top one. This whole purpose of the spectrum is actually to, to, to see when you're looking at objects and try to identify their properties, they're all related to this, to this, uh, to the, their inside temperature. The brighter the object, the bluer it is. So that's basically what this, what this, uh, what this thing is. If two objects have the same peak, they peak in the same frequency, they must have the same, uh, basically, temperature. And this is actually given by this law, Will's law. The peak, temp the peak frequency, which is called lambda max in here, is given by this constant number. So it's 3 million divided by T. Now the frequency again is in nanometer. I mean, the wavelength is in nanometer. And T is the temperature is in Kelvin. So in your book, it gives you what is the temperature would be for a, uh, for a 12,000 uh, nanometer, basically for Rigel, okay? No, I'm sorry, this is not Rigel, okay? So this is a different uh, star. 
So let's say, because this is 12,000 nanometers, is a very, very long wavelength. Actually, this is object probably is gonna be super cool. Let's check it in here, okay? So for 12,000 nanometers, we're gonna do the calculation here. I'm gonna stop this one in here and try to find the, uh, the, uh, the temperature for it. Okay, so what is that uh, slide? The one we do calculations. So again, I'm gonna come into this in here. So Wien's law says that basically lambda, the maximum frequency, or the maximum wavelength is given by three times 10 to the power six divided by the temperature. And that means that the temperature is the same thing, three times 10 to the power six divided by lambda max. And they told us lambda max is about 1200 uh, nanometers. So, was it 1200 or 12,000? Let me check. Okay, I think it's 1200. Yeah, 1200 nanometers. So, if I'm doing this calculation now, so this is three times 10 to the power six divided by 1200 times, remember a nano is 10 to the negative. I'm sorry, yeah, we keep it as is. Remember the formula says lambda meters. Don't convert anything, keep it as is. So if I do that, then uh, and uh, the, wave, uh, the, free, uh, the, the light is gonna come out, uh, I mean, the temperature is gonna come out immediately in Kelvin. So basically I have to divide three million by uh, three million, divide that by 1200. So that's all the math to it in here. So divide by 1200, and the answer is 2500 Kelvin. So the answer for this, uh, for this temperature, the answer to that question, so if you're gonna do this slide in here, is about 2500 Kelvin, okay? So this is the answer for that part. I'm gonna leave this, so I'm hoping that this note, you guys are gonna see them later on. So we're gonna do the same thing for the other one, the, uh, the other uh, question, and the other question says, what is, if lambda max is actually a lot shorter wavelength, 300 nanometers, remember shorter is higher frequency. So when we say it's shorter, it's higher frequency. So we're gonna come back into this expression, let me go back into the slide, and change this number to 300. Okay, we don't convert anything. So we'll have 3 million divided by 300, and the answer is gonna be, of course, what? Some one, very, very, about 10,000 Kelvin or something like that. It's gonna be super, uh, super, uh, Super hot object. So let me go back into the uh, stop sharing this. Go back to the other slide. So here is the question Lambda max, the maximum wavelength, wavelength is 300 nanometers. So what is the temperature? Again, you're going to divide 3 million divided by. In this expression, 3 million divided by uh, 300. So the 100 cancel this one, and then you have 10,000 Kelvin. So that's basically in a nutshell the answer to this question. Okay. Power flux is basically this area. Let me go back. The bigger the objects, like this one in here, for example, the 6,000 Kelvin, this area is how much output of energy it emits. This area is how much energy it emits. And the object, in, uh, according to this uh, theory of the black body radiation that explains how stars and objects in general emit light. This is true even for us, basically. We are at room temperature 300 Kelvin, and uh, we emit light at night when the temperature in our surrounding is a lot cooler than us, and because our bodies maintain that temperature of about uh, uh, 300 and something Kelvin, uh, we become warmer and we start emit radiation in the infrared actually, or, uh, and that's when we have those goggles. So this formula is true for any object. It doesn't have to be a star. Even a planet, even a moon emits radiation, and we can study those objects that way. So this is true for ob all objects. This is the power output. It's proportional to the, to the temperature to the power four. In other words, objects that are even double in, 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 uh, in, uh, in temperature. So if the temperature were to be on the sun, not 3,500, we double it to about 11,000 Kelvin. The, 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 the power output, how much energy we receive from the sun 
will be 16 times as high and the temperature will be too much. Okay, and the temperature will be too high on Earth. The Earth will be basically toast. There will be no way that uh, life can grow on a planet that is too, uh, so close from the sun when its temperature doubles. In other words, the so-called habitable zone of the sun will expand. And for Earth to be, uh, uh, again, habitable, you have to be away from the sun. Okay. Are we getting, somebody is making a comment in here or something. Let me go to the chat quickly in here to see if somebody, because so I can't see the chat while I'm in this mode in here. So let me stop the sharing quickly. Yes. Okay. Uh, a question about uh, Venus. Venus, what happened to Venus? Venus actually is an habitable zone, okay? And what happened to it is another problem altogether for Venus. That's a question from Haley. That's a very good question. Uh, Venus, Earth, and uh, actually Mars, they're all within the habitable zone. But the case for Venus is that for, for some reason, 150 million years ago, 700 million years ago, you were between those, something caused its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its gas, gas, basically, CO2 and uh, water to evaporate, and for some, and now it's in a runaway gas, uh, I mean, the greenhouse effect that caused it to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, it's temperature to rise so much that it's actually the hell, the, the worst place on earth. Okay. Uh, okay. Haley, did you take astronomy before? Can you answer on the chat any of? Because you seem to know a lot about uh, this. Uh, <laughs> okay. Because she made a very good point in here. I don't know if you guys are, uh, are, are, are following or not. This uh, O B A F K uh, M. Those are the classification of the stars depending on their uh, on their temperature. Yes. Okay. So I, I guess, guys, you need to. Uh, I, I'm. I can't see these comments when your guys are. Uh, yeah. Uh, when when I'm doing the full screen mode, but keep uh, keep on bringing them, and hopefully we'll catch the questions too. Okay. Let's continue this discussion because I'm hoping to finish this chapter. We don't have to finish it today, but I'm hoping somehow that we can get some, some stuff done today, okay? Let me ask you a question since we are ready for it, I think. I'm gonna stop the sharing of this screen. I uh, also share the other screen now, the one with the calculation. Where is that screen here? This one. Okay, I hope you guys see this screen now. I'm gonna bring the questions I have in here for you guys. There's gonna be a poll on the chat room. They're gonna answer them on the question that is gonna poll right now, if I can get that poll again. Okay, I can do the poll while I'm doing this. Okay, so I'm gonna bring these pictures in here and I'm gonna put the first question so you guys can take the question in here. Use the graph to determine which of the following best describes how star A would appear as compared with star B. Star A would appear to be more red than star B. Okay, so we can share these things in here. Okay, yeah, here is the poll. Okay, so I want you guys to look at these questions in here in the poll. And while you are looking at this graph in here, you're gonna answer the first, Two questions. The first question it says in here, use this graph basically. This is the graph I'm talking about in here. Okay. Does everybody see the graph in here? Star B. And you should have the, uh, oh, should, I'm gonna launch the, uh, the poll right now. So, use the graph. I've tried to determine which of the following best describes how star A would appear as compared to star B. You guys have the uh, polls now uh, up? Yes? Yes. Okay. I want you guys to look at these two stars. There is a star A. This is its graph. And star B is its uh, second graph. And in here, I have the different colors of the... Uh, of the, uh, of the spectrum, the visible spectrum. We have violet, 
indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Star A is the one with this graph, the one that is higher, and star B is the one that is lower. So you're gonna look at that graph and you tell me if star A would appear more red than star B, or both stars appear more red than blue, or both stars appear more blue than red, or star A would appear more blue than star B, or none of the above. Again, this is not, this is greatest for participation, so your answer doesn't matter, as long as you can guess hopefully the correct answer. And then double check your answers later on. Let's go, guys. You have all the questions and submit. I'm sorry, I have all of the questions in here, yes. Uh, the last two questions are for, it looks like a graph that's... Okay, there. yes, yes. I just want to see question one and two first. And if everybody is ready to move, question one and two are just related to this graph. Questions uh, after that, they are not related to this graph. They are related to a different graph. Okay, so let me pull at least another graph closer to it. What are the two graphs I have in here for questions one, and I think two and three, okay? For question number uh, three, it says basically, question number two first, let me read question number two. It says use the graph, at right, the same graph as before, okay, the first one. Use the first same graph and to determine which of the two stars, A or B, so it's still dealing with stars A and B, emits light with a longer peak wavelength. Is it star A or is it star B or both stars emission are at the same wavelength or none of the above? So these questions are related to that graph. Let me look at number uh, uh, Question number three, you graph at the right, which is which of the two stars, A and D. Now, this is a different graph. The first two questions dealt with stars A and B. This graph is deals with the stars A and D, okay? Question number three, use the graph at right to determine which of the two stars, A or D, gives off more green light. Is it star A that gives off more green light? Or is it star D that gives off more green light? Or they both give the same amount of green? Again, remember, look at the bottom. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. I have some people who have questions in here. I can't see the questions while we're doing the sharing of the screen in here. If you guys don't have a microphone, it's going to be a little bit hard until I finish this, uh, this question. Okay, so that's question number three. It's related to this graph, okay? Not the first one. So if everybody is okay, we're moving to the next question. Question four. Use the graph at the right to determine. Now, we're dealing with stars A and C. So for this question, it's the last of the graph. Uh, question number four, basically. Use the graph to determine which of the two stars a or C is at a higher temperature. Is it star A that has a higher temperature? Is it star C that has a higher temperature? Or the two stars have the same temperature? Or it is not possible to tell which one has more temperature than the other? That's question number four. And the last question in the poll is, it's related to the stars A and C again of this graph. Use the graph at right to determine how the size of star A compares to the size of star C. Star A is smaller than star C, or star A is larger than star C, or we cannot tell, okay? 
I have so far four people locked in their answers. Five, six, seven, eight. Still have a few more to go. How, how are we supposed to submit answers? Uh, I think when you, is there like a button in the bottom where it says to yeah, submit? After, after you answer all of them, the submit button will be available at the bottom. Yeah, okay. How do I answer all of them? Like through where? Do you have the poll in front of you or not? There should have been a thing that popped up on your screen. I can view, I don't know. I don't see anything that lets me like work. My poll didn't pop up either. Oh, okay. What device are you on? I'm on a um, Yeah, I'm on a laptop. Oh, okay. Because okay, for those who have difficulty with their uh, with their polling, please uh, send me messages later on. Private, you don't have to put them in the chat room. And let me see how we can fix that down the road. Okay, right now I have 11 people who submitted their polls, and I know that we are 19 right now who are uh, taking the polls. All right, 18. I'm sorry because that counts me. I'm not sure if it's Zoom or not because it wasn't letting me on the chat room for a while either. I see. If you guys have had difficulty, please email, uh, text me or um, sorry, email me through Canvas directly and I will uh, go through the poll again and make sure that you're giving me credit for it. And uh, we're going to discuss the answers shortly. Okay. 12 people so far. We're going to give you uh, probably two minutes to finish this. Okay, so that we can get the answers. Okay. Thirteen people. We still have one minute. So the last one or two, please uh, submit yours before we, if you can, if you can, then text, um, send me a message saying that I was not able to. Again, like I said, you're going to get a participation point. This is not something about, uh, uh, because this is not set. Okay. I think the two minutes are expired, so I'm going to end the poll right now, and we'll discuss the, uh, the answers, okay? So, let's go to the questions in here. Let me move this out of the way. Question number one, use the graph to the right to determine which star has the, uh, has the appears to, uh, how star A appears compared to star B. Star A would appear more red than star B. That's not correct, okay? Star A, if anything, is a blue to this side. Both stars would appear uh, more uh, red than blue. That is not correct because B is actually toward the, the uh, star B is toward the red side, so it appears bluer, I mean redder. Both stars would appear more blue than red. That's not correct either. Uh, star A would appear more blue than star, star, uh, than star B. So that's the correct answer. So this is the correct answer. Now, same graph. Looking at them, use the graph to the right to determine which star A or B emits light with a longer wavelength. It's clear star B is. Because the longer wavelengths are to this side toward the red on the other side. The shorter wavelengths are on the other side. So that answers that question. Now, uh, question three is related to these two stars that seem to be have the same intensity in terms of P. Uh, use the graph to the right to determine which of the stars. A or D gives up more green light. If you follow the green line, yeah. you would yeah. see that actually they emit the same intensity. You see the line extending from G for green that's where the two graphs meet. So the intensity is identical. So the correct answer for this one, they both give off the same amount of light, green light, okay? They may differ other things, but at least as far as green, they have the same intensity. Now, uh, use graph, the graph on the right to determine which of the two stars, A or C, is at a higher temperature. Because this one is peaked, this frequent, this, I mean, we thought earlier that the higher it is, the more temperature it is. 
but uh, star A or star C, or both of them have the same temperature. They're put, both peaks get the same lambda. You can see that the same peak in their peaks. Therefore, they must have the same temperature. This is kind of tricky a little bit because some people might think that the star A is probably uh, more uh, hotter than star C, but they actually have the same, in color, they have the same color. They look the same. So both of them have the same temperature. Use the graph to the right to determine which star compares to the star. Of course, star A is much bigger because it's emitting more radiation, as you can clearly see. Its peak is higher in intensity than the other one, so it must be bigger in size. So star A must be larger than star B, than star C, I'm sorry. I hope this exercise was helpful in trying to clarify that, that how this radiation is, uh, is working. And if, you, of course, you have any questions, please let me know so that we can discuss them. Or uh, if it's not clear to you, we can discuss them later on, okay? You can always ask these questions in the discussion group and the, uh, in Canvas, especially general questions like this one. So let's go back into the PowerPoint in here. So we understand uh, Stefan law, this is called the Stefan Boltzmann law, that the hotter the object, the more power is going to output. And uh, we also understood basically Wien's displacement law that the, uh, that's why those two stars had the same temperature because lambda max was the same for both of them. Although one of them has a higher intensity than the other because the wavelength was the same, they have the same temperature. So one of the properties of light, let me start from this slide in here. One of the properties of light is that actually this experiment was done by Newton. He was, uh, he took, a, he took uh, basically uh, the, light, uh, the white light. And I tried to run this earlier with the prism I have, but it did not work well for me because I don't have a point source source of light, I tried to build one, but I couldn't. But if you have a monochromatic, uh, uh, not a monochromatic, if you have a white light, basically, not the same frequency, it goes through the, uh, through the prism, it's going to break, it's going to refract in here, it's going to come into different portions in here. And then it's gonna break again when it comes out of the, uh, of the prism. And uh, the, the law of refraction in here, there are two main laws as far as uh, light is concerned. There is a reflection, and refraction. So uh, this is something that is basic stuff. So if somebody is going to go into kind of uh, become an up, up, what is that? Up to up, optometer or whatever you guys <laughs> call that. Let me go into the uh, the graph in here. The people who work with the eyes, basically, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Where is my slide thing in here? Yeah, it's this graph. Let me go back in there. Let me go back into where my I was taking notes here. Okay, one word about the notes, okay. These are my own notes, so I'm hoping that you guys are taking your own notes. There is actually a lot of research that says that uh, if you're learning anything, you really need to take your own notes. All of them being uh, basically uh, the ones that you're gonna have. I'm gonna post them later on, but I'm hoping that you guys take your own notes while we're talking, and especially if you have any questions, that's when they become handy. So don't rely 100% on this note, okay? I'm gonna post also the questions that I have for you guys in here, namely from the other, uh, the other, uh, what is it, section, okay? So, uh, the reason why we came in here, I forgot exactly 100. Uh, so, the laws of refraction, okay? And the laws of light, basically, there are two laws. There is a beam of light that comes in, hits the surface, and bounces off. This is the law of reflection. The law of reflection basically says that uh, the incoming light, this is the incoming, the, this is the one that came in, and the outgoing light, they make the same angle, the angle of incidence, that's this angle, and this angle of reflection, they are the same, okay? So when you stand in front of a mirror, and you look at yourself in the mirror, that is actually the law of reflection at work. The light leaves, for example, your foot when you're looking at your feet, and comes, hits the mirror, and pulls it back to your eye, and you see a reflection of your mirror that is the same distance from yourself. And actually, if you keep on looking from your toes all the way to your head, you're gonna see a reproduction of yourself in front of the mirror. I hope you guys know by now that actually, that the other, there is no other person on the other side of the mirror, okay? <laughs> it's just a reflection of yourself 
based on the law of reflection, okay? The second law, this is the law of refraction. So again, if I have an incoming light in here, and it's coming from a medium where light travels with a different speed. Let's say, for example, this is water, and water has a higher index of refraction. So light, as it goes back in here, so it's not going to continue on straight line, but rather it's going to break in here, okay? It gives you this, this, this perception here, okay? So again, the angle in here of refraction, and this is the angle of incidence, they're related and there is a relationship between them. It involves how fast light travels in water versus how fast it travels in that medium. Now, apparently that property is, depends on the wavelength itself. So that means if I send a red light and if I send a blue light, they don't refract on the same way. The blue and the red, they refract differently and therefore light, which is white light, which is made up of all the frequencies, when it hits the surface, that it has a different speed where light, is, light first of all travels with the same speed. But in here, there are more materials in water where light bounces on and off, and it appears to be moving uh, slower than in air, for example. So in that case, uh, we have the frequency of the light that is broken, and we can see, uh, we can see different, uh, different uh, 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 all the different spectra, basically, of the uh, of the spectra of the, of light. You can use a prism for that, or you can use basically. Uh, uh, let me go back into this slide. So a prism would work actually. So the higher the wavelength, the more basically refracted. The shorter the wavelength, the more refracted it is, versus the longer wavelength, which seems to be less refracted. And that's actually how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, actually, uh, um, the word is escaping me. You know, uh, we're gonna talk about it. I forgot it. The word escaped me. Rainbow, I'm sorry. Rainbow, okay. A good opportunity for it today, although the clouds are uh, dissipating, so there's not probably much rain to see anything of rainbow tonight, today. Anyway, light again, Anything shorter than 400 nanometers, this is again in the ultraviolet region. This side and here, we can see. It looks black to our eyes. Anything longer than 700 and some odd uh, uh, nanometers is actually infrared, and we cannot see. It looks black, black to our eyes. And the spectrum is in here. And again, like I said last time, it really depends on, our, on how our eyes perceive things, okay? Uh, when light comes, uh, is emitted off of an object, it doesn't matter, let's say, for example, the sun, from the nuclear and reactions in there, that light is supposed to come to us intact, but it doesn't. It's going to go through the different materials that the sun has, and some frequencies are going to be missing in here. We are not going to see them, okay? Those uh, frequencies, the reason why we don't see them is because they were absorbed by the material that is in between. And this kind of spectrum is called an absorption spectrum. So there are two types of spectra. There is the absorption spectrum and there is the emission spectrum. And an emission spectrum is an object emits light, and then you go and analyze it and see what kind of frequencies you have. And uh, you use for that something called the, uh, I don't know, I think I had one, but I probably don't have it handy with me here. You use something similar to this, and I know we have it in the lab, and I was hoping to, uh, to, to, uh, to show that to you guys. This is actually a, uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, at least the uh, writing on it. So this is a 500, oh, it's because it's reflected. I have to use, you have to use, do you guys, can you read the number in here? It's 500 lines, basically. There are so many lines in here. This is a diffraction grading, okay? You take light, and it's going to break into, and you're going to see the different frequencies, okay? So this is something that is used to analyze frequent light. Of course, we use now far more advanced electronics than this, especially for the, for in, in, in kind of, uh, uh, in astronomy. But this is how basically uh, it was before. In the old days, what they do, actually, they used to, used to make it out of the ash mixed with water and then you make it on a very fine surface and you start to making lines with very sharp objects then you can make uh, uh, 
the linings that you need to do a spectral analysis. And light will be broken into different frequencies. Again, if it's emitted, you're going to see a, uh, an emission spectrum. And in the case, of, and that's going to be just the frequencies that are emitted. If the, all of the frequencies that are emitted, you're going to see them all, and the light will become uh, white, actually. But if only just certain frequencies that are emitted, you're going to see just those frequencies that you see. Of course, if they're outside of the visible uh, uh, region, you have to have pressure detectors to see them. We cannot see them with the naked eye. An absorption spectrum is similar to this graph in here. This is basically where uh, 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 objects are, uh, are absorbed, OK? OK. So this is, again, is an, uh, the first one was, a, was, a, uh, was a, an absorption spectrum. This is an emission spectrum. These are the characteristics of sodium. You have to have all of these frequencies together to tell if sodium is, a, uh, is, is present or not. Same thing, if I see how this specific lines in the spectrum, violet, a little bit of uh, different shade of violet than like a bluish or greenish color, uh, actually toward the uh, 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 color that is a, uh, not really blue, but toward the green. And then uh, all the way to red uh, frequencies, those are signature of hydrogen. So if something is emitting light, and I see this four lines in the spectrum, I know specific. And those lines, they fall a specific value in the bottom. They're not the random values. For example, the line of calcium and the line of uh, hydrogen, they look identical. However, if you move toward the one side or the other, you will find more for the calcium than you would find for the hydrogen. And you know then and there. That calcium was present or hydrogen was present. You're continuing analyzing the spectrum. So one line will not make basically the entire spectrum. It will not tell you if the element is there or not. Probably will narrow it down to just a few elements. But as you can see, more and more in the presence of the light off of the specific uh, material. So spectral analysis is a very, very powerful tool that is used not just in, in astronomy, but used extensively everywhere in, in, uh, in uh, in, uh, in science and actually forensics and everywhere else to analyze different uh, the properties of different components everywhere, okay? Uh, in the case of the uh, absorption spectrum, it's done the other way around. So basically, if, uh, let me go back uh, into this point in here. If you have, an, if you have a, a star that emits light and you have an object that's between us and that star, like for example, a cloud, interstellar cloud, and that cloud, for example, we can tell specifically what kind of material it has or does not have, okay? This is what I was talking about. The rainbow formation is coming from the fact that light, white light that's coming from the sun is actually made up of all kinds of frequencies. And that's basically what we see here as a rainbow. Actually, we can see even a double rainbow in this picture being here, which is formed after uh, more than one reflection, actually two reflections. In this case, you have the white light coming in, then it reflects in here, and then it uh, 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 refracts one more time. In the case of a double, uh, a double uh, rainbow, like the one in the middle, that is basically you're going to, you guys see the same second rainbow, and it's the inverse rainbow, actually, it's backward. Because there is another reflection that is going to put them back in here, so that you will see the second one. Studying light is actually a lot of beautiful stuff in it. I don't know exactly what's going on with my screen, but it looks like somebody is putting probably some marks in there or me or something. I don't know. Okay. I guess you guys get that in the school also that this session is may, um, may be hijacked. So you have to be very careful with the, how you share your uh, link with other people so that we, we don't share them actually at all. That's why I removed them from Canvas. So the only way for you guys, and that's really what prompted me to send that message today, for you guys to be aware of what's going on okay, in terms of the security that we secured the sessions, and they stay only between us for our purpose, otherwise it's going to be a problem for us. Okay. And uh, so uh, this is basically the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, how, we're trying to explain how the spectra is. Okay, my computer is about to die now. Okay, so. Okay, uh, this is basically how to explain how spectrums are forming. 
So we have to uh, analyze the uh, the uh, in order to understand how the spectrum, basically the different lines, are forming in any kind of analysis. So uh, the experiment uh, toward the end of last century, beginning of this, uh, toward the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, that basically uh, showed beyond the shadow of the doubt that the atom is made up of two main components: electrons and uh, uh, a cloud of electrons that is, it turns out to be N to B, and an inner core, which is the center or the nucleus of the, of the atom. For the most part, as he said, a uh, alpha beam, which is uh, actually a hydrogen, uh, I mean helium atom that are uh, devoid of any electrons, moving straight through a, uh, a, a, a gold foil in here, for the most part, they go unimpeded. That means the atom is made up of vacuum, basically, of nothing for the most part. Some of them get deflected in here, or actually reflected backward in here, and that is where they bounce off of the nucleus, and that is basically what that showed that most, for the most part, the atom is actually made, is empty. There is nothing in it. So, and the, the, when you excite an atom, this is basically the structure that we ended up with. So in the center, there is an electron, and uh, the and the uh, around one of its orbits, basically there is an electron. This picture, of course, is not 100% accurate, but this is a representation of how the atom looks like. So the actual picture is far more complicated than this. For instance, this single individual thing that is more like a cloud. It's like a wave. Okay, and uh, the inside the nucleus in here is where all of the properties of the atom are. You have, it's made up usually of neutrons and uh, protons, and uh, the number does not have to be always the same. This is the hydrogen atom, I mean the helium atom, I'm sorry. The helium atom in here is made up of two neutrons and two positively charged uh, protons, and in the shell in the outside in here is where the electrons uh, uh, are in there to, to, uh, to balance in, uh, the, the proton's charge and make the whole atom as being neutral, basically. You took some chemistry, you go, we delve into this topic a lot, okay? The distance between uh, uh, the center of the atom and it's basically a shell of electrons is about 10 to the negative 10 meters or 0 0.1 nanometer, okay? Or uh, uh, an angstrom, that's basically another way for to call it. But remember the frequencies for the light is about 700 nanometers. That's the visible light. Uh, the X-rays is about this much, okay? So this frequency is very, very, uh, uh, um, the transitions are very, very short if you do them this way. Very short wavelengths, I should say. The size of the nucleus is a lot smaller than this number. It's about 10 to the negative 14, which is a very, very small number, okay? So that's why this number, although it looks very big, I mean very tiny, 10 to the negative 10, but relatively speaking compared to 10 to the negative 14, this is 10,000 times bigger than this number. So for the most part, it's void. There is nothing in the atom. Uh, atoms do not have the same number of proton, uh, neutrons at the end for the same element. They come up with the, in the so-called isotope. For the hydrogen, the main isotope is the one that is made up of a single proton in its nucleus. And uh, there is a deuterium, which is actually a different element and tritium. That's how we know, difference of the spectrum analysis also, what kind of structure a specific star has and what kind of uh, helium and hydrogen and all of the other components it has and so on and so forth. Just by analyzing the spectrum analysis, we're gonna go a little later into this for discussion. We have uh, a little over three o'clock, but we need to finish this chapter, hopefully. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. We can follow the discussion later on on, uh, on our discussion group in, on Canvas. So, these two guys, Neil Bohr and uh, Max Planck, actually did a lot of work on the structure of the atom. And we came up with this basically picture as far as the atom is concerned. This is the, uh, how basically the spectra are. If, a hydro, if an electron is excited from its ground state, let's say for example, they are, uh, the, the, there is a bunch of energy in here due to heat or whatever, cause the electron to move from its ground state all the way to this level, N5, level five. In other words, the energy levels are quantized. They're, uh, they're uh, a finite number, one, two, three, four, five, six. They are not continuous structure, okay? 
this is the ground state it's actually n equals to one and uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the electron is supposed to be let's say for example to survive here in n equals to two but somehow it received a lot of energy found itself in n equals to five it has to go back to its ground state by emitting light and that light will be very 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 energetic because it has to make this jump from a very uh, uh, high energy level all the way to where it's supposed to be so it's going to emit this frequency that is extremely high energy versus the blue green for the, the blue light for example in going from n equals to four down to n equals to two or even shorter wavelength less energy is emitted in going from n equals to two I mean, sorry, n equals to three to n equals to two. So that's how we found these different colors. So the colors are actually a measure of how intense the light is coming off of an atom when it tries to go back to its ground state, basically trying to regain its, its, uh, its, uh, its normal state. This is true not just for the atoms, actually, even for the nucleus. That's where you get gamma rays, too. So it's, the gamma rays are coming from the inside. They don't come from here, from transition of the electrons. So any time you have an object that is excited and wants to go back to its ground state, it's going to emit light, basically, of a given frequency, and the frequency is dependent on uh, how high the jump is in terms of the energy. So this is basically the different uh, 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 emission spectra for, uh, for uh, different particles. Again, this is the absorption. This is the emission lines. And different people made different contributions to different uh, lines. And uh, the bottom line is you go from a high energy. This is actually from an infinite. This is completely ionization. So if you go the process backwards, you're removing the, uh, the electron from it where it's supposed to be all the way outside of the atom. So that's called an ionization, actually. And regaining it back is going to, if it's going to fall back, it's going to emit backwards again. OK. This point I talked about when you have, for example, a source of continuous spectrum like the sun, for example. This is how the spectrum would look like. All of the lights would be there, including the ones that are ultraviolet and including the ones that are infrared. This is what our eyes would see. This is with the, with the diffraction grading, like I showed you earlier, what you would see with your own eyes. But uh, if the light, for example, goes through a cloud of gas, for example, between you and the object uh, that emitted it, uh, you will see some missing lines in here. And you go and look at the parallel wavelengths of the slides, and you see specifically what kind of element was in the gas that absorbed those frequencies. So you can tell the structure of this intergalactic gases sometimes, or interactive objects sometimes, or interstellar objects uh, sometimes, what they're made out of. So you can tell exactly the structure of this one just by looking and analyzing this, this slide. Okay. Now, one more effect in here that we're going to conclude with it, this chapter, and it's very important, and this is a Doppler effect. You probably have experienced a Doppler effect when you're uh, riding in your car and you hear the siren behind you, okay? If the car is approaching that emits the siren where the police or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the paramedics or something like that is emitting uh, 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 frequency, you can tell without even looking if they're approaching you or receding from you. If they're approaching you, the sound will be here going to a higher and higher pitch. In other words, you're going to listen and you're going to hear it that it's going to uh, higher and higher frequencies. When you listen to it, that means very, very shorter and shorter wavelength. That's basically what higher frequencies mean. If it's receding away from you, it's moving away from you without even seeing where the source is, you can tell if uh, by just listening to the sound and you're going to have it into lower and lower pitches. That means uh, 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 lower frequencies, that means high, uh, longer wavelength. That's basically what we experience on a daily basis. We call this phenomenon the Doppler effect, and it's true also for light too. It works the same thing for light. So basically, you are an observer, 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 observer A, and there is a light source in here that is coming toward you. Let's make the case, for example, where you're not moving. You're in a station, for example, and waiting for the train. But as the train is approaching you, it has its siren on. So it emits the light when it was in position S1, and then it moves again and emits another light. So after it emits the first light, it moves towards you and emits the second light. 
So instead of the light, if you are not moving at all, they're faced by a wavelength lambda, as you can see from this picture in here. This distance is supposed to be the wavelength between each front, wave front and wave front is exactly uh, a lambda. That's exactly what we know as the uh, crest of the, uh, of the different uh, things here. I'm not drawing this lines that you guys see and I don't know how they are appearing. And if somebody is doing it, please stop, okay? And if I'm doing it by mistake, I'm sorry, okay? Anyway, the point I'm saying in here is uh, this, uh, this line in here the, the, between wave front and wave front is lambda. When you are both of you stationary, but since so the source is moving, they appear to be compressed. In other words, the source sends a wave, uh, wavelength and then moves and sends another one. So they appear to be coming closer and closer to one another, uh, to one another and you, you would perceive them as having shorter and shorter wavelengths, meaning higher and higher frequency. If you are observer B, for example, on the other side, they appear to be unaffected because <coughs> the motion of the observer has very little displacement in this position of the observer B. So in this case, you would say the object is either, either not moving or it's moving in a perpendicular direction as far as I'm concerned. For observer C though, the, 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 the source in S1 emits a wavelength and then moves away and emits another wavelength. So the distance, instead of being its lambda, it has increased to longer, uh, what appears to be a longer wavelength. Remember, the source is still emitting lambda. It's not changing that at all. So uh, the distance between each wave front appears to be longer and longer, meaning that the frequency appears to be shorter, uh, I mean, less and less frequency. That means that it appears to be shifting toward the less frequency. That means it appears to be moving toward the red, uh, to, uh, toward the red color. That color is less frequency, of course, and uh, longer wavelength. So observers see when objects are moving away, we'll always perceive them where all of the spectra, let me go back to this for example, appears to be shifting. This lines, they will appear to face the same thing as if before except that they're all moved slightly toward the red if the object is moving away from you. If the object is moving towards you, the, uh, the entire spectrum appears to be actually moving in the opposite direction toward the, red, toward the blue side. This is what we call the red shift or the blue shift. For example, most of the galaxies nowadays, when actually I have to look at them, so that they are all, at least the far away galaxies, their wavelengths are shifted toward the red. And that's how we concluded that actually the universe is expanding because what else can explain the fact that everything is moving away at incredible speed actually. So that's basically because it looks like all the galaxies, they were at some point in here and then they emitted their light and they're moving away from us, the further away galaxies. <coughs> this has turned out to be not true actually for Andromeda, for example, and the triangulum galaxies those two galaxies, which are kind of our neighborhood, about 2.5 million light years, is very far, but actually they're, uh, they're within our range. Their actually frequencies are shifted toward the blue. So at some point, our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, and the source of light that is coming toward this, namely from uh, Andromeda, they will collide in the near future. According to some studies, actually, they already started the uh, collision, their own collision. So, I hope uh, this chapter was, uh, I, I don't know, if, I hope that you guys will go and read the chapter. Okay, let me stop this uh, thing in here. Okay. And uh, you don't have to worry about it, Jose. I know you sent the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, stuff you did in here. Let me download it quickly. Download into the folder. You guys, if you had difficulty, please go to the discussion group and post there that you had difficulty. Uh, I'm not sure of how these things are going to be recorded. I know I'm recording the entire session in here so that you guys have it in there. So I'm going to put your name in here attached to it also. So when you put a document in here, please put your name on it. So that's great.
Yes, the question that is asked in here, are this slides going to be available on, uh, on Canvas? I think they're already on Canvas. And we were asked about the exam. I'm going to post uh, an updated version of the syllabus, so please don't uh, don't uh, don't uh, worry about the exam for right now. So I want to get some materials first, and I know we're supposed to cover about 12 chapters, so right now we're doing a little bit uh, uh, less than half. So we'll see. We'll see exactly when our exam is. It's going to be definitely. Uh, most likely, I should say, before uh, the uh, the uh, spring break. I mean, there is spring break in May. I mean, in April. I'm sorry. Okay. You guys have difficulty with sound, everybody, or just a few people? Okay. Okay. If you guys don't have any further questions, like I said, I will post this one. Please do not forget you're supposed to, uh, to go to a discussion group. Again, just a reminder of how that looks like. I know that uh, we discussed that last time around. I don't know if everybody was here or not. Let me go into uh, this uh, section here. This is where I want you guys to come in. To go into uh, so this is how you are going from now on to connect again in here. But if you come in here, you go to the discussion groups. And there is already chapter five in here, discussion group. Please ask all of your questions in here, okay? I know I already posted something in there for you guys for the notes from last time and uh, the recording from last time. The recording takes a little bit of time to become available. So once it becomes available, I'm going to again come in here and post the, uh, post the link for it for the rest of the class who did not show up. I know some of you probably are working, especially given the fact that a lot of people now are, are asked to be there. But do not forget that there is an assignment that is due today. Okay? You're supposed to finish that calculation for the violet. Okay? I'm expecting everybody to to do that by, uh, I think, like 11 o'clock tonight or 10 o'clock at night or something like that. Don't wait until the deadline and start submitting it because it's going to be a problem. Okay. And it's part of the assignment, actually, you come in here to assignments so that you guys are uh, aware of where to go. So if you, if you have any questions about it, so it's going to be a chapter five participation. You click on it and you're going to come in here and it says a file upload. Okay. So this is the, uh, let's see, edit it again to make sure that, because I was thinking to, uh, to add uh, the other questions to it, but I made those questions just the uh, normal uh, participation there in the, uh, in the uh, on Canvas. So uh, no, I'm not, I'm sorry, on Zoom. So uh, only one question. To be submitted. Concerning the calculation of the wavelength of the violet light. Okay. See notes as uh, made available in the discussion. Bring the link to that discussion, and it's chapter five discussion. Okay, so please, if you did not do already, do submit it. Okay, any questions for me? I have one question. Uh huh. Uh, will we be, be going over the um, OBFGKM spectrum, like for easier explanation? That's, for the part, uh, that's part of actually astronomy 1B. That is not part of astronomy 1A. The, the question is basically the different color classifications of the stars and things like that. And the, uh, the galaxies, that's part of astronomy 1B. And astronomy 1A, the only reason why I did that is because uh, 
doing a spectral analysis actually you, uh, is needed not just for uh, astronomy 1b but actually astronomy 1a because we can tell i mean how can i tell you that for example uh, jupiter is made up of such and such if we don't do a spectral analysis so it's still true for the solar system as it is true for the galaxy for the galaxies and the stars so but the star classification is part of uh, astronomy 1b i just showed you in here and the example using the sandbox basically of how stars look like if you take astronomy 1b you will see more in depth those those classifications and the stars and actually uh, I, I'm not teaching astronomy 1b uh, next. Uh, actually, I'm going to be teaching astronomy 1 is still in the uh, in the summer. Uh, but if I'm going to do astronomy 1b, I'm going to use extensively the sandbox and do some uh, some modeling, basically, of how planet Earth Earth would look like, for example, uh, on uh, near one of those stars, if it's going to survive at all, if its temperature is going where on uh, around one of those stars. There are a lot of interesting questions that can be asked. Is there life, for example, around any of those stars? For example, Rigel or Betelgeuse or something like that. And if it's there, how would it look like? So that uh, software, at least the Universe Sandbox, is a wonderful software I use extensively in all of my astronomy classes. Unfortunately, we're not going to delve into stars as much in this class because that's basically we're limited by um, the amount of time and the course uh, schedule that we can do that. Okay, but that's a good question. Also, I see a lot of people are having trouble hearing you. Are you using the mic on your um, computer or is it the mic on your headset? It's the microphone of the headset. I thought it, uh, I tested it last time. Okay, did everybody have the difficulty hearing? Because I will, what I will do also actually is uh, I'll test it again and uh, and you will have the recording in uh, on Canvas, okay? Just uh, maybe check the sensitivity on your headset. I don't know if uh, you maybe, did because yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I did it. I lowered it because it was very yeah. What do you say? Anything here? Yeah, I had it very low actually. I'm sorry. Oh it man, it was very, very muffled and um, almost yeah. like you're too close to the mic. But we can all clearly see like you're very. Like it's from the headset. So it's just hard to understand, but we could still understand you. Yeah, let me remove this in here. Do you guys hear it better now or is it the same thing? Um, it yeah, still I mean, sounds a little bit the same. Yeah, I tried to make it a little higher right now. This is the highest I'm going with the output in here. Okay, uh, I will try to find solution to this problem before hopefully next class, which is on Tuesday, uh, a week from uh, two days ago. <laughs> okay, please stay safe and uh, observe all of the requirements in terms of safety and everything else, okay? And communicate with me if it's something that is only for, for concerning you, you can communicate with me directly through Canvas and the normal emailing things, but if it's something related, uh, related to a course, please do ask that question so that uh, everybody benefits from it, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.